Hi everyone, I'm Wei Kai, and I'm going to talk about our improved lower bound for oblivious RAM. This is a joint work with Ilan Komagoski from the Hebrew University. So the problem of oblivious RAM or ORAM consider the scenario of outsourcing storage. We have a client, it has only a very small storage. So we outsource a huge data array to a cloud server. The data is accessed piece by piece. In case the server is compromised or corrupted by an adversary, we encrypt all the data on the server. However, encryption is not enough because the adversary can still see the location of the accessed data. If these locations depend on the get data contents, then just looking at these locations, the adversary can infer very sensitive information about our data. To defend such an adversary, Goldreich and Ostrowski formalized this problem using the standard random access machine model. Of course, at their time, the cloud storage was not as popular as today. So the correctness of ORAM is exactly the same as a standard array. We can uh, update or query an array entry using the index of this entry. And just like the standard array, uh, a query has to be answered before the next operation, either update or query comes in. So it's totally the same as the standard array. Now, the array is just an abstraction. The processor or the client has no space to really store the content of this array. So this array must be stored on the memory or the server side. Historically, we say the memory is an array of memory cells and read or write a memory cell is called to probe the memory cell. This terminology also distinguishes the physical memory array from the abstract data structure array. So that's the correctness of ORAN, just an array. For security, we consider an adversary that can see all the memory probes, that is the locations of probed memory cells. For security, we hope the adversary doesn't learn anything from the probed locations, and uh, especially we don't want the adversary to learn our top secret, our operations performed on the abstract array. To do so, we require or we call an ORAM is secure if for any array operation on the top, the produced memory probes are computationally indistinguishable to the adversary or even stronger, identically distributed. The identical distribution is a stronger notion of security, but uh, in this talk, we are considering the lower bound side. So stronger security makes it easier to think about later in this talk. So that's the security and the correctness. Come back to the uh, outsourcing data outsourcing scenario. We have a client. We want to run some program that is written in 64 bits. So our ORAM wants to simulate an array of n entries. Each entry has 64 bits for the 64 bit program. But uh, the server speaks in network packets. Each, pack each network packet may be a million bits. So we have the memory cell a million bits in size. Or alternatively, the adversary can be if strapping a hard drive where the uh, block size in this hard drive is 1 megabits. This introduces two extra parameters, the entry size B and the cell size W. In some scenarios, the cell size is equal to the entry size, but uh, in the scenario here, the cell size can be a million times greater than an entry. With the parameters M, B, and uh, a W, 
uh, we define the efficiency of ORAM as the following. That's the cost per operation. The cost is measured in the number of memory pools. This is the standard definition for uh, standard efficiency for data structure problems. We want to know the per operation cost and the cost is measured in the number of memory accesses. In the literature of ORAM, this efficiency is also called the overhead. But uh, in our scenario, we consider the cell size can be different from the uh, entry size. So we feel IO efficiency is more appropriate and avoids confusion. I also want to stress that we care less about the number of bits processed, but uh, of course the number of bits can be translated from number of probes by just multiplying a vector w. With the model of ORAM, there's a long list of upper bound constructions. In one extreme, when the cell size equals to entry size, we have a recent construction, Aptorama, that achieves log n in efficiency. That's optimal. On the other extreme, when the cell size is square root, we have the famous square root ORAM proposed by Gorak and Ostrovsky. I want to note that when the cell size increases, the same construction can still achieve the same I.O. efficiency. So the I.O. efficiency can only be decreasing with respect to the cell size. And the lower bound by Larson and Nielsen is consistent with this intuition. The low bound says that the efficiency increases with respect to uh, cell size or inverse of cell size. So the main question in this work and this, in this talk is whether we can achieve better efficiency when the cell size W is greater. On the upper bound side, uh, we now have better techniques from recent works. Also, many classic algorithms like sorting can actually do better when the cell size is larger. On the lower bound side, this lower bound suggests that if the cell size W is a million times greater, we could probably enhance the performance by a million times. That would be amazing. Or speaking asymptotically, if we could improve or, or increase the cell size by a logarithmic factor, this suggests that we could uh, improve the I.O. efficiency from log n to a constant. That is also a huge improvement. So uh, there's no impossibility so far, but like our title suggested, we improved the lower bound side. And uh, our lower bound says that the efficiency can only be increased uh, with respect uh, by a log factor in cell size. That means if we increase the cell size by a logarithmic factor or polylogarithmic factor, the efficiency will only improve by roughly a log log factor. Or speaking in the uh, example, if we increase if we have a cell size a million times greater than an entry, then the speed up can only be something like 10 to 20 at most. Moreover, our lower bound matches the upper bound in the other extreme when the cell size is very large, like greater than any n to the epsilon. So, our lower bound leaves a very narrow range in parameters that is still open in upper and lower bounds. Next, I will dive into our lower bound proof. I will first use the correctness of ORAM, that's an array, to prove a technical lemma. And then I will use the security of ORAM to improve our technical lemma to our four lower bound. 
Our starting point is the previous work by Larson and Nielsen. They proposed a harvest sequence consists of a update phase that stores a long list of random values into the abstract data array. Uh, the uh, abstract array, and then there is a second phase, the query phase, that restores these random values back from the abstract array using queries. Because this uh, random values is a very long uh, random string of bits, so the ORAN has no way to store these random bits in the processor side or the client side, this random, long random string has to be stored on the memory cells. And similarly, in the query phase, in order to answer the queries correctly, the ORAM has to read memory cells to answer the queries. So there is an imaginary wall between the update phase and the query phase. Any information from the update phase has to go through the memory cells to get to the uh, the other side of the wall, the queries. More precisely, every random bit in this random string has to be stored in the intersection of the blue and the brown sets. To see why, consider some random bits that is stored in the blue set or some information about the random string that is stored in the blue set but not stored in the intersection. Then that means uh, when the query comes in, the change in the random bit cannot be reflected in the outcome of these queries. And then the ORAM cannot be correct. So uh, if this uh, intersection has to store the whole long random string, then this intersection has to be large enough. The long random string consists of n times b bits. So this intersection is at least n times b divided by cell size w, number of cells. Divided by the number of queries, then we have a lower bound for uh, the cost per query, that's b over w. However, we argue that this b over w is too good to be true. Why? Because when the cell size w is extremely large, it seemed like we could have a construction that answers a query without even reading one single memory cell. That just doesn't happen in upper bound constructions. But this can happen for this specific query because this query sequence is sequential, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there could be a construction that prepare all the future hundreds of queries in advance. To address this, our key ideas throughout this work is to use a even harder sequence of operations. We use the same sequence, same update sequence as before, but now we query random entries in the whole array. That means for every query, we pick a uniformly random entry in the whole array and uh, query this entry. Like before, uh, there is still a imaginary wall between the two phases. Before the wall in the update phase, the ORAM has to somehow write down the long random string in this blue set of cells. And then later in the query phase, the ORAM has to read the memory cells in order to correctly answer the queries. And we hope that the intersection between the blue and the brown set is still large enough even we change the sequence of operations to do so, uh, let me take a closer look. In the update phase, uh, the ORAM has to write down this long random string to prepare for any random query. So the blue set is uh, roughly large enough to store the whole random string. And now in the query phase, 
I want to prove that every random query will make the ORM to read or probe a distinct memory cell in this blue set. I claim this indeed holds with high probability and uh, this is actually intuitive. To see why, recall that in the update phase, ORAM has already written down the long random string in these blue cells. In this blue set, the ORAM may use any arbitrary, maybe crazy encoding to write down this long random string. For example, the ORAM may use locally decodable code. But anyway, this long random string is fixed, written in this blue set. Now a random query comes in. Uh, the ORAM, in order to answer this query correctly, the ORAM has to read a corresponding memory cell. Not any other cell, but the specific memory cell that can answer the given query. And we have a sequence of random queries. This enforces ORAM to perform reads or probes on random memory cells in this blue set. That way, every random query will enforce the ORAM to probe or read a memory cell in this blue set until almost all the cells in the blue set are probed or touched by the ORAM. And this is exactly why we use a shorter sequence of queries because we want to uh, probe or hit almost uh, or a lot of cells in the blue set using a small number of queries. Putting it together, uh, we can prove that with high probability, the intersection between the two phases is still roughly the same in size, in the number of cells. But now we, uh, we use a shorter query sequence. So now the per query cost is almost one probe or one IO with high probability. This is our main technical lemma. It's very simple, it's very intuitive, but it is also very hard to prove because uh, we don't assume any restriction on the ORAM construction. I will briefly show the challenge in the proof later in almost in the end of this talk. So now we have our technical lemma. We use only the correctness of ORAM. I will boost or enhance the technical lemma to a stronger lower bound using the security. So in the security model, we have an adversary. Uh, the adversary sees all the memory probes. It doesn't see the uh, abstract operations performed on the array. So the adversary doesn't really know we are performing a hard sequence or not. However, our technical lemma says that if we perform a hard sequence, then there is a sufficiently large intersection in the probes. The adversary observes the probes can calculate this intersection easily. So if we switch the sequence of, of operation to any second sequence, the second sequence must have the same a uh, set of intersection, otherwise the adversary can distinguish between the first and the second and that would violate the security. And uh, we intentionally choose the second sequence to be another hard sequence that is uh, padded with some more operation and uh, shifted the wall a little bit. This way the second sequence will also imply another sufficiently large intersection by a technical lemma. And this second intersection is defined with respect to a different range of operations. So 
uh, these two intersections both add to the total cost of ORAM, and we can switch to a third uh, sequence of operation and so on to add more cost to the ORAM. This slightly improves the lower bound, and we are not stopping here. We can, in addition to move the wall, we can uh, scale down the hard sequence that's a shorter sequence of updates and even shorter number of queries. This shorter hard sequence will give another intersection at some more cost, and we can still move the wall and so on to add some more cost to the ORAM, and we can keep doing so. We can even further scale down the uh, hard sequence recursively that will make a complete tree. The tree degree is proportional to cell size W, and every tree node will have a corresponding a uh, will have a corresponding hard sequence with a corresponding uh, large, sufficiently large intersection, and uh, so that will add an extra cost to the ORAM. The remaining is just calculation. We have a lower bound for n query or update operations, and uh, the lower bound is proportional to the tree height, that is log n base w over b. And this is exactly the lower bound I claimed earlier in our main result. So at a higher level, our proof consists of three steps. The first step, we use random queries. The second step, we prove our technical lemma. And in the third step, we enhance the technical lemma to our uh, main result, the lower bound. I want to stress that our lower bound is very strong. It is, in, it is unconditional in terms of no restriction on the ORAM construction, and uh, it is computational, and uh, the ORAM can use any arbitrary computational assumption because our adversary is extremely efficient. It just need to calculate uh, the intersections. I promised earlier that I will show our uh, main challenge in the technical lemma. We prove it by a contradiction. Suppose the lemma doesn't hold, then we have a too good to be true super efficient ORAM. Then that means we can construct, we, our strategy is to use this ORAM to construct an impossible, an impossible compression that can compress down a random string. If we can do so, then that is already a con contradiction because random string cannot be compressed. The compression is based on the result of Patrasco and the domain. And the main challenge is in the analysis of this compression. Or more specifically, the main challenge is to bound a specific involved conditional probability. We spend a lot of effort to reduce and simplify this conditional probability. And uh, the simpli simplified version is the following. It is very simple and uh, clean. I'm not going to elaborate on this probability problem, but uh, I believe it uh, is an interesting practice problem in, for example, probability cores. I hope this inequality in conditional probability will be useful in your future research. Uh, hopefully useful for my own future research. I'm wrapping up here. We improved our lower bound and uh, our technique extends to other settings. For example, multi-server ORAM. There are still open problems. For example, uh, the lower bound or upper bound for weaker or stronger notions of ORAM. I also want to advertise for our new related results. For example, we constructed an optimal ORAM that runs in worst case time. It is also published in the crypto conference. 
this year. Thank you for your attention. If you find this result interesting, please read our full paper or send us an email. Bye.